and Kepler has found 1,200 planet candidates so far. So there's roughly 2,000 candidate extrasolar planets. We're finding them everywhere. The universe is full of planets. So if it's full of planets, this opens up an interesting idea. <laughs> Maybe alien abduction, after all, was correct. Because when Bruno and Epicurus said about countless worlds, frankly, they had no data to support that assertion at all. It was an interesting concept, it was an interesting hypothesis, but no data. Now, we've lots of data suggesting lots of worlds. So, back in the 60s in particular, alien abductions were very commonplace. And I just wish I was a bit older so I could have participated more readily in those alien abductions, but possibly for the same reasons that when I remember the first time I went with a couple of friends of mine lying on the beach in Marbella, and um, there were these very pretty girls come along with um, uh, these vouchers for the nightclub. And they walked straight past us, I remember. And we were not happy on that. <laughs> and we felt, why did you not abduct me? <laughs> Bit of a stretch that, but you kind of get the idea. <laughs> so maybe it was because we were white and lying on the beach that the aliens didn't come near us either. But let's imagine that there are others that they might be interested on. So we can ask some questions about alien abductions, and there's a point to this slide away, and it's almost the last slide. We can ask where would they come from? Well, now at least we have an idea that there, there are possible destinations from which to come from. So nobody can say to you, if I say, I've been abducted, well, I don't have to do, I don't have to do any funny voice, I'm just like, I've been abducted. <laughs> I've been abducted. Now, usually the conversation would probably progress from that, like, you know, what happened and so on, ordinarily, or... <laughs> but let's imagine we're actually interested in this person. So we say to them, well, you know, yeah, we know there's lots of planets. <laughs> How would they get here? Okay, well, we know that you can travel in spacecraft. We, we do it. It's slow, but it's doable. Okay, so you can say, well, there's no way to get there to here. There is. We can, you, you can do it. It takes time, but you can do it. So there's places to come from, and there's a mode of transport to get here. So now you go into the second sort of level of questions. Well, why would they come? Now you see, it's not clear why they, they would come, but you can say there's no reason for them to come, because you don't know what they're thinking. So maybe they have a reason, whether we know it or not. So it's possible. You start to get into the, yeah, I believe you, I don't believe you. Why would they hide themselves? So we lose you up here, well, they really try to keep themselves hidden and all the rest. And for those of you who are Star Trek fans, we've got this Prime Directive as a concept. Who's a Star Trek fan? Who knows of the Prime Directive? <laughs> oh, I'd love to see... <laughs> I'm proud to be a Star Trek fan. <laughs> Although my dad goes on about why, you know, when they accelerate, you don't end up at the back wall of the spacecraft with a T all over you. He always <laughs> I tell them it's a force field, Dad. I mean, really, stay with the technology. So, why would they hide themselves? Well, I don't know why they hide themselves, but they might have a reason. So, I can't rule that out. And then, why would they abduct you? It, it might seem silly. For example, if you do have the technology to come some distance, probably it, it lacks a certain amount of credibility that they bother to abduct you, that they, they need to do that. But maybe they do. Maybe they're. Maybe they're really smart physicists and really stupid biologists. So, you know, they've come all this way, they found us, they thought, no idea what's going on, we're taking in hell. Can't rule that out. But now we get into things that we can start to ask, which are then moving from sort of definite questions, which are perfectly reasonable, into, well, you know, we can debate, into the questions, the data. How repeatable are the abductions? So, if you've been abducted, how many times? When did it happen? What were you doing at the time? What was the sensation? Ask the questions around the abductions. Are abductions ever observed by more than one? And you have to ask credible person, okay? So, two mates saying they were both abducted or whatever like that on many of the occasion is, is one that's very much thrown into question. But you can ask 
a question like that. And then, a really important one. If you've been abducted, is there anything novel about what's happened to you uh, that would suggest something that's beyond what, you know, something innovative. We keep on using this word, these words, innovation, entrepreneurship, and all the rest. But well, my guess is if you come all the way from Alpha Dzingo up here, that you're probably either innovative or entrepreneurial in your approach. And, and there'll be something new you can tell to us that we haven't thought about. But if we never find satisfactory answers to, for example, those questions, or as a final one, and these were just a couple of the sorts of questions, materials, we hear of crashed sites, lots of possible things falling down, all the rest, absolutely indentations all over the place. I remember when I was young, I was born and raised in Tundalkin in Dublin, and I remember the Irish UFO Research Association came out one time with Geiger counters, and they put them down on, these, on this field, and they said, yes, 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 that's the three legs of the landing craft, and there's more radiation. Obviously, where the legs go down, there'd be more radi radiation, wouldn't there? Well, no. Completely not obvious at all. In fact, you'd imagine that's where there wouldn't be any radiation, because the legs are in the way. But, but I mean, obviously, and obviously, there'd be radiation as well. So, I think you should get something to talk about radiation, by the way. But the thing is that if there are these crashed spacecraft, you can reasonably ask, and Roswell is the key, sort of key example, why don't we find sort of some sort of evidence? But you can actually break down the whole alien abductions. And Sagan makes a very interesting point about the novel information. He says that the thing about alien abductions that stands out in his mind is not how amazing it is. It's how unbelievably boring and unimaginative they are. It's just, oh, I was abducted and they stick things up here and they push things down. But there's nothing about it that suggests something you wouldn't imagine by sitting in a room or talking with others. And the other thing about alien abductions, by the way, which makes you sceptical in the true sense, if I can use the word the true sense, um, is that the, the, uh, the predictions are always centered on current issues. You know, AIDS, if it's during the 80s, say, nuclear power during the 60s. But in the 60s, they didn't predict AIDS or whatever. So there's no suggestion that, well, we kind of went through this or you need to worry about that new type of technology or, you know, have you considered Facebook? for example. <laughs> Nothing like that is, is actually pr provided. So it's almost kind of retrospective information. Whereas if you take the young slits experiment, it's, a, it's providing you with forward perspective, if that's a word, probably isn't, but anyway, forwardly looking information. It's showing you something which is data which you don't yet understand, as distinct from talking about things that you do, but just talking about them in a different context. So if you go back to our skeptical list, if we have the situation with ghosts, here's the, the way I look on these things. Um, and this is, just, this is a completely personal view. I have no idea what happens to us when we die. Okay? Because there's, to me, there's no data one way or another. I don't know what happens. I don't know if some of us tried to come back as yes, shadowy figures to irritate our friends and neighbours and so on. <laughs> But what's clear is that there is no credible, reproducible evidence that this goes on. And I think at some point, if there's no credible, reproducible evidence, just because it's possible doesn't make it likely. But the one thing I will put in the caveat that I will put in is, we have been fooled. Science still fools us. If there is something called a ghost, if there really is an afterlife, that's an enormous discovery. So what we should potentially do is we should look for credible mechanisms to test out these important hypotheses. And they're important even if only because people want to know, did something happen to my loved one? That's a, re that's a very valid question to ask. And science can't answer that if the ultimate basis for ghosts is completely within their power. If they're outside of the laws of physics, for a better, for, for use a better term, then, yeah, then science, which relies on some knowledge of some laws and the applications of the scientific method, is going to get lost very quickly. It, it's hard to see that, that, that the majority of the claims around these have any basis at all 
in what they claim to have a basis in. It is absolutely possible that some people completely believe they've been abducted and it's a mental I issue. If there really are people coming to us from another planet, that would be amazing. I would love to find that out. So it's not as if it's a closed-minded thing. I'd love somebody to go along. I'm not going to do it, but let somebody else do it. I didn't discover this either. You know, I mean, well, I wasn't even born, obviously, so that, that was a hindrance already. But the thing was that I, I, I'm glad that we know that, and I'd love to know that alien abductions... Yeah, or that, sorry, I'd love to know that aliens exist. I think it'd be cool. I, I can't imagine a universe in which we're the only creatures. It just seems very, very difficult to imagine that. So this isn't impossible. But science and scepticism, which go hand in hand, uh, haven't found any evidence for it. In fact, in a sense, the opposite. So, to conclude, in science, some phenomena are really difficult to explain. Some are difficult to understand, and some have no complete explanation. So, should we be sceptical? Well, of course we should. But not suspiciously so if the phenomenon is testable to a greater or lesser degree. So you can start off with a test that indicates something, and you need to do more testing and better testing. But as long as this, 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 uh, you're not just suspicious of everything, in other words, science requires you to be sceptical, but to think of tests that can check out whether you are right to hold that sceptical viewpoint. And I want to make the point, I've already made it, but that some of our most basic scientific tenets have still not yielded to inquiry and remain a puzzle. It's part of the fascination of science, but I'm not even talking about things about exactly why certain types of cancers grow. I'm talking about things that are even much more fundamental like that, the very fabric of the universe in which we, which we live. We really don't have a good understanding of that. I was at a talk with, that a cosmologist gave a number of years ago, and he talked about cosmological theory and the fact that the mathematics suggests that we have maybe an infinite number of universes. And he was saying, so we, you know, we're, in, we're in one of those infinite number of universes. And he said he went home and he, and he realized that if you have an infinite number of universes, then there's an infinite number of things going on, an infinite number of times, all the time. And then he thought, so that means that no matter how bad a presentation I make here tonight, <laughs> in some universe I'm getting a standing ovation right now. <laughs> so, so what if I have one bad universe, somewhere else... You guys think I'm brilliant. <laughs> I, I just thought that was a really, you know, it made me cheer, cheer me up no end. I have to say, and it might do so tonight as well. But the thing is that if that's complete speculation, and you will hear a lot of talk about multiple universes and so on. There is not a shred of evidence for multiple universes. None. Zero. It's all mathematical at this point. It may turn out to be the case, but we have no observational evidence. I, look, I wish there was, or... I wish we had a way of testing for other ones, but we don't have that at the moment. So, an almost final thought, which is one that I like. Again, I may have shown some of you this before. The most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not Eureka, I found it, but, hmm, that's funny. And in fact, that's exactly the way most of the things that are funny about the, or that fundamental about the universe come about. It's realising that something doesn't quite fit. And when things don't quite fit, it's often not that you can simply squeeze them together. It's often you have to unravel the whole lot. And it's exactly this wave particle duality that I refer to was exactly that. Newtonian physics is simply incapable of explaining what I just and um, what some others shot saw tonight independently. The, the, the diffraction of light. Newtonian mechanics cannot explain that. Even our new quantum physics has a bit of difficulty with that. So the final thought, X-rays are a hoax. And this was said by our old friend, Lord Kelvin, who was at times a noted sceptic and at other times just a little bit mad. So that's all I have to say on my take on a bit of scepticism. Thank you very much for listening. Uh,